We're now going to consider one of the more famous domes of the Middle Ages going into the Renaissance period, and it is the dome of the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, Italy. Continuing with this idea of person, object, and story, the person who we're going to focus on now is Filippo Brunelleschi. He was born in 1377. He died in 1446. And he is the architect that was responsible for the construction of the dome on the cathedral and also what is known as the lantern of the Basilica de Santa Maria del Fiore. Um, what is so significant about this particular accomplishment? In the Middle Ages and going into the Renaissance period, there was a great construction program going on through different parts of Europe especially in Italy, and the desire to create wonderful, magnificent cathedrals uh, was present and was pushing the society. It was a great matter of civic pride that uh, a town or a city would have its magnificent cathedral. And um, the finishing matter of it was simply the dome. The domes are very beautiful. They are a little bit like the curve of heaven when you're standing underneath the dome looking up. It's a little bit like looking into the sky at night. Um, and domes also create some very nice acoustical functions within the cathedral itself. So to have a cathedral without a dome was problematic. Now why did they have a dome? They didn't have a dome because domes were very, very difficult to construct. They did not have the range of modern materials we have today, and they didn't have some of the concepts of engineering that we have today that would allow for a dome to be created that would not collapse in on itself. But this is the man, Filippo Brunelleschi. And he is, you'll see in this particular statue, he is facing upwards. The location of this statue, this portrait of him essentially, is across the plaza from the cathedral and the dome he built. And if you were to stand next to the statue and look up in the same angle in which he's looking up, you would see he is looking at the dome and the lantern, which is the small cupola on top of the dome that allows light to enter naturally. But you would get this sense. Notice in his right hand we have a compass a tool of artists and architects alike. Uh, his clothing is typical of the day. Take a good look at his clothing. See uh, the amount of fabric and cloth that is made in this particular cape and garment he has on him. He was uh, fairly successful judging by um, the appearance of his clothing on this particular statue. A little bit more about him himself. He was a goldsmith. He was an architect. He was an artist. When people talk about someone being a Renaissance man or a Renaissance person, they're usually referring to multiple talents and disciplines and abilities. And in the Renaissance period, artists and artisans of all types had to acquire a range of abilities in order to be able to um, make, a, make a good living for themselves. In addition to these particular normal kinds of things that he had, his ability to work in architecture and goldsmithing and also as a visual artist. He's also credited with the idea of developing linear perspective. And interestingly enough, he did this in combination with some painting work that he was doing at the cathedral. Um, he noticed that there were implied lines of straightness that would diminish towards a single point off in the distance when you would look at buildings when you see the objects at, at, at length at a particular distance. And so he actually set up an experiment where he was able to create a painting of the baptistry in front of the cathedral. He was able to set up a mirror and then he was able to look through a small hole in the painting and compare it accurately using his system of linear perspective against the actual object himself. And lo and behold, uh, everything lined up perfectly and beautifully. Um, and it, it is uh, the system of linear perspective began ad adopted by the Renaissance artists, and they used it as a way of creating three-dimensional realistic things, especially architectural, uh, architectural paintings of types. Here's an aerial view of Santa Maria del Fiore. It was built over quite a period of time, from 1296 to 1436. And in this photograph, we see the baptistry, which is that small octagonal building on the lower left-hand corner in the plaza across from the entrance of the cathedral, or properly speaking, the basilica. We see the basilica, cathedral itself, 
And then also notice just to the right that very tall square tower, that's the bell tower. Notice how high it is. The higher the bell tower, the greater um, the likelihood that the citizens of the city could hear the bell, bells chiming different parts of the day or when the bells were sounded in celebration or in mourning or for alarm or alert. Um, the taller the tower, the more the sound spreads. Then we also see the magnificent dome. Notice how much space the dome takes relative to the rest of the cathedral. And notice how high it becomes. Again, this was a point of civic pride, and the people of Florence really wanted to have a good dome on their cathedral. The original architect of the cathedral wanted to have a dome, but was not able to engineer it because the weight of domes and the materials that domes are made of sometimes would cause domes to collapse on themselves. So how did this all come about? There were actually several stages to the cathedral. If you look at this illustration on the left, you see the Santa Reparata, which was the original church on that site. Um, that church was removed in uh, previous times in order to make way for a much larger church, one that would actually be a cathedral, one where the bishop of Florence would actually have residence. And so um, Arnolfo de Chiambiano uh, created a cathedral, a much larger, much more grand version of Santa Reparata. And you can see that that is that golden colored outline uh, footprint in the middle. And then uh, before they finished the building of that, or actually before they really started construction of that, they aggrandized it, they enlarged it. Francesco Talenti, um, took Alfonso Chiambiono's diagram, his plan, and expanded it, enlarged it, simply enlarged it, and created the footprint of the cathedral as we know it today. Now, we get up to this point in the story, and we still have a problem because there's no, there's no dome, and there's a dire desire to have a dome. So there was a great competition for the dome, and... Um, the Medici family, uh, a family's name who you may recognize, a uh, very wealthy political and uh, economic business people of the community, uh, sponsored, along with the church, a competition to have an uh, architect name who could create a dome, create a design for this dome, to do basically, from an engineering standpoint, what was not possible before. Now, the Medici knew Brunelleschi as a profoundly great artist and architect of the time, and so the Medici, Cosimo Medici, was a champion or an advocate in this process. He politicked in the background to get uh, the commission for creating the dome um, from the church. And it's interesting because Brunelleschi um, was a very, um, a very uh, nervous kind of person. Some might people say neurotic, but he was very nervous and he was very afraid that people would steal his plans and his engineering ideas on how the dome could be built. So he created a code. He submitted the actual documents using these coded drawings. Well, the church officials really couldn't evaluate it. But Cosimo Medici had enough political clout that he was able to push it through that committee and have the, um, the commission for creating the dome awarded to Brunelleschi. So again, here we see three stages of the cathedral. On the right, we have um, the statue of a Santa Reparata, which is in the current, um, the current cathedral, and it is, again, in memory of Santa Reparata, which was the original church that that location housed. So, back to domes and architecture. Aside from the fact that to have a dome was a matter of great civic pride and the, and the, the great magnificent city of Florence, the citizens, um, would essentially feel shortchanged, you know, living in probably, in their opinions, the greatest city in, on earth at the time. Um, aside from national pride, domes do have a lot of importance in architecture. They provide a natural acoustical amplification that reflects and focuses sound. If you had a priest that was speaking underneath the dome, that priest or the bishop could be heard clearly and easily throughout the main section of the church without any amplification whatsoever that we have today electronically. Now, domes are aesthetically pleasing, and they provide a really wonderful visual contrast to the linear aspects of a room under the dome. From the inside, as I mentioned before, the curve provides an illusion of continuation of space. It's a little bit like looking into the night sky.
and seeing stars. Now, some domes actually have an oculus, a small opening that allows light in. And in previous times, um, in, in the case of the Romans, the oculus would usually allow for the escape of smoke from burnt offerings in their particular um, use of the dome. Now, the other nice thing about domes is you can place a dome on top of a cylindrical building, a cylinder, or you can take a square building with a barrel, in other words, um, some special bracing that allows a transition between the dome and the building. What happens with all this is that uh, a dome can be placed basically on a square or rectangular opening or in a round opening. Either one is fine. There's uh, just a matter of engineering you have to acknowledge and honor. So here are some things about difficulties in creating domes. Historically, there have been some phenomenal casualties due to collapse of domes, especially in regions of the world where there are earthquakes. But domes collapse because the weight of the materials can exceed the ability of the dome to support itself. Stone and concrete have very limited spans of distance that they can cover. The second is that uh, if there is an insufficient base size for the span of the dome, the dome itself can begin to uh, push down its weight and can actually push the walls of the supporting structure out and the entire building can collapse, not just the dome. The third problem is that domes don't have a supporting structure. They don't have a tall vertical pillar to support it. That's why it's a dome. So um, these are three engineering problems that must be overcome anytime a dome is built. So Brunelleschi, through studying domes of other civilizations and other times, and through his own ingenious methods, came up to two parts uh, to a solution to this problem. The first part was a structural solution where he created a system of ribbed supports, like a framework, that will look like the ribbing inside of a ship hull. If you were to flip a ship hull upside down and see the ribbing that held the side boards of, the, of the, uh, the base of the ship together, it's a little bit what you'd see. Now, in order to keep things from spreading and causing things to collapse outwards, he created a series of interior chains um, made of stone and iron and wood, and these chains were basically a combination of rods and um, long, um, long beams and poles, and there were a few physical chains as well. But that series of chains would keep the domes from spreading outward. You may see those same kinds of things in older buildings, um, even today in cities. If you go back to buildings that were created maybe a hundred or, or more than a hundred years ago, sometimes on the outside of the buildings you'll see small stars or you'll see small um, cylindrical disks with a bolt stuck in the middle of it. That is the same kind of matter. There is actually in those cases a rod that runs from one side of the building to the other through the floorboards and those, that rod or those chains keep the walls from this, these very old buildings from uh, po poking outwards and collapsing. So structural solution of ribs and the chains. And he also came up with an innovative use of materials. He decided to use brick to make the dome itself rather than stone because brick has incredibly high strength and significantly lower weight and still has sufficient density to be able to stack bricks upon each other to form a beautiful curve of a dome. So he was using the most modern material he could, which was special bricks and the structural solution of the rib system combined with the chains. Here are a couple of drawings of the dome of Santa, Ma Santa Maria del Fiore. It shows the interior chains and the ribbing designs. If you look on the diagram on the right, you can see the ribbing. Um, uh, they've taken, the, the artist has taken away a section of the roof to show you what the ribbing, and again, it looks a little bit like the ribbing of a ship hull, okay, and supports the weight of the, the bricks and the domes stacked on top. Also, you'll see a lot of these small dots. Take a look at the left. When you take a look at the left, you begin seeing a cutaway view of the dome, and you begin seeing also how um, there are these small structures that align up with those dots that are forming those chaining uh, again, that keeps the, the dome from pushing outwards and collapsing in on itself. This is the completed dome with the lantern. See how beautiful the lantern is? And again, it was a way to finish off the dome. Interestingly enough, there was some debate whether or not Brunelleschi should be the artist to create the lantern. But again, um, through uh, political means and some thinking it through, 
the church fathers decided that Brunelleschi eventually would be the creator of the lantern, and he received an additional commission fee for that work as well. Notice on the particular lantern, it again mimics the octagon of the dome, and it goes up to a, a cross on top of a round sphere, symbolizing the cross um, being on top of the world. And again, this creates the highest place in Florence. Again, a matter of civic pride for the citizens. As we look upwards, and our neck tips backwards, on the interior of the dome, we see a beautiful fresco that's been painted on plaster by artists. And uh, you'll also see uh, the shape of the octagon, and you see windows allowing light to come in. And if you look in the very center, you can see it's as if you're looking up into the lantern itself. See how much light that that particular lantern is allowing into the into the uh, dome itself. It really creates a lot of illumination and natural lighting for the um, for the entire thing. Now, if you look very carefully, you can see some very small white dots around the periphery of the octagon. That is artificial um, artificial lighting, electric lighting that has been added since then, obviously. But it illuminates the dome and illuminates the beautiful frescoes, which are basically telling the stories um, of creation and in the Bible. Now, in addition to the uh, the dome of the cathedral, there are several engineering things I'd like to point out at this point. Uh, for one thing, you can on the right-hand picture, you can actually see some of these rods that are extending across the cathedral itself. And again, those are rods that have been added to help fortify and prevent spreading uh, of the... Um, of the walls. And again, the idea of the rods was not new to Brunelleschi, but he did borrow it from even the basic structure itself. Um, you'll notice the immense grandeur of this particular um, particular opening. See how small the people are compared to the great, enormous cavity. And you can also see how the roof of the main part of the cathedral has, again, the same kind of ribbing. Um, and again, this was uh, to allow there to be a curved roof of some type rather than a flat roof. Take a look on the left-hand picture, the immense ornate decorativeness of the outside of this beautiful cathedral. Those particular um, circular objects uh, on the face of the facade, those are actually the outside windows of some very immense stained glass windows that it, when you go onto the inside of the cathedral, you see these beautiful stained glass windows. The piazza or the plaza in front occupied with numerous people. Notice the doors on the front of the cathedral. Um, they're very beautifully, ornately decorated. Again, they are of immense size. The entire door can be open, um, but also in this period of time, they also created smaller doors within doors, so this way they'd only have to open up a normal size door. They didn't have to open up something that um, um, an, an immense uh, <laughs> chariot or something like that could pass through. Okay. Uh, something else that was interesting too that's important. In Florence, by civic law, there was no external buttressing allowed uh, for buildings. Now, a buttress is a, an external brace that is usually triangular in shape that sits against the side of the building that keeps the walls from spreading out. Uh, the Cathedral Notre Dame in Paris is a cathedral that has the external buttressing that you may be familiar with but that was not allowed in Florence and so that's one reason why the uh, the internal rods and chaining were required on the main part of the building itself um, not even to mention the, the the dome in order to make the dome work this is a night view of the Basilica de Santa Maria del Fiore and again uh, notice on the left hand side the square bell tower and on the right-hand side, the dome itself. Again, even in modern times, it is very much a matter of civic pride. Um, and just think for a moment how much electricity it's taking to illuminate that very beautiful cathedral at nighttime. Because again, it is one of the great treasures of Italy. At the same time, it is probably the most um, famous architectural treasure of the city of Florence.